This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. I want you to go to Revelation 3. The capacity to be stirred. The capacity to be stirred. Do you have that capacity? That will be tested this morning. You'll know whether or not you have capacity <clears throat> to be stirred. Revelation 3rd chapter. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast named that thou livest, but thou art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. Therefore, if thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief in night, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon you. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, unless you get a little concerned that I'm going to apply this to Times Square Church, that could be, couldn't be further from the truth. Jesus is talking about a church that died. He talked about a church that had life and a good reputation that died. This is not Times Square Church. This church has a reputation of being alive, and it's a reputation that lives. This church is on fire. This church is not dead. I'm not a dead pastor. There's not a dead pastor on this place. Pastor Carter had it right that God has made this a burning bush, and we pray it will be a burning bush until Jesus comes. But I'm stirred by what I read about what can happen to churches in all my travels all over the world, in every city, I take you from Berlin, I can take you through all of Europe, take you through South America, take you all of the United States to cities and show you churches that once were thriving, lampstand churches full of the Holy Spirit, winning many souls to the Lord on fire, even in this city. I can take you to some buildings right now and show you that when I first came to this city 40 years ago, the place was packed. People were getting saved, orchestra, choir, God moving powerfully, and today is nothing but death. And so God is trying to show us what happens to families, to homes, to individuals, to pastors and churches, and what causes spiritual death. This, is, this uh, does apply to Times Square Church. It applies to me as a pastor, to all of us, as warning. And I'm stirred by it, and I take it to heart. I want the capacity to be stirred by what I read. God help us when we're beyond the capacity to be moved by the word of God. Lord, we love your word. We thank you for it. And I don't know why you have put this on my heart this particular time, but I obey you, Holy Spirit. I've always obeyed you. You made me a promise years ago that if I would preach without fear, I and if I would preach with mercy and grace, but never holding back what you speak to me, whether it's prophetic, whether it's corrective, whether it's blessing, whether it's encouragement, whatever it is, to speak your heart as we receive it. And now, Lord, I, I come to you needing strength. I need the anointing. I, I need to be able to speak this from your heart. Sanctify me and give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Now, the portion I read you just now, read to you, is one of the most neglected truths in all the Bible, seldom ever preached. 
it is, you can't find much in any commentary about chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation. In fact, I read a statement <clears throat> made years ago by Archbishop of the Church of England, Dr. Trench. And he said, according to the canon of the Church of England, and I read it clearly what he said, it is impossible whatever for the second and third chapter of Revelation to be heard in any of our congregation. Outlawed. You don't speak according to the canon of the, the churches by Dr. Trance, and I can give you the, the place he said it at the time he said it. We will not touch Revelation 2 and 3. Most prophecy writers who focus on the book of Revelation skip to chapter 4 before they begin. They won't touch 1 to 3, and especially chapter 2 and 3. You won't find it. I ch- you search your commentaries, search your books. You won't find hardly any, re- you'll find hardly any reference to these two chapters. Here is the solemn word of Jesus Christ dictated right from the throne room. And it is ignored. And Jesus said, blessed is he who hears and reads it. There's a blessing promised. And why is it that this chapter has been ignored? This is one, these two chapters are hated by Satan. Because it's the one thing that is an antidote against the deadness and dryness of the church and the apathy. And the devil does not want this preached in any church anywhere on the face of the earth. In Revelation 1, Christ appears, a walk to John on the Isle of Patmos, and he's walking. He, 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 he looks like burning fire. There's a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, and his eyes are burning. His feet are on fire. And he appears among seven burning candlesticks, and he has five, seven stars in his hands. And the scripture says, the seven stars are seven angels of the seven churches. The seven candlesticks are seven churches. Now, the angels are ministers. In the original Greek, they are ministers. And almost all my reference sources agree with me on this, that these were ministers. And John was commanded by Jesus himself to send seven letters to seven churches. Now, there are two schools of thought about these seven churches. Now, there were little churches, seven churches in Asia, and beginning at Ephesus, running through uh, Laodicea. <clears throat> two schools of thought. The dispensationalists believe, they're called dispensationalists, they believe that this represents seven phases of the church, or seven generations, beginning with the Ephesian church, that was the New Testament time perhaps, and all of these various phases of the church ending in Laodicea, and they believe that we're now living in the Laodicean phase or period in the church, the history of the church. Others believe that this, these are seven individual respective churches that had in them, they, they, they had that which represents what would happen every church age, that even today we have the Ephesian type who have lost their first love, we have the Smyrna type, we have the Laodiceans, and we may, we may be now in what is called a Laodicean period, but I can take you to churches, and right in our church, we have all seven kinds of people who are blessed and corrected by these seven letters to seven pastors. Now, <clears throat> that is beside the point. The point is that God sent Seven letters to his church. These were mostly corrected. Five churches were corrected and lovingly rebuked. This was not a message of wrath. This was God's love trying to awaken his body, to awaken his church. These churches mostly were small congregations. Some of them were worshiping in secret. And they were not well known. They are just small groups. But they, they had been started. The pastors were sons, spiritual sons of the Apostle Paul and John and the other apostles. There was an apostolic ministry. There was healing. There was a church that was live awake, doing good works, charitable works, good things that God saw. And Jesus mentioned these good things in this church. But Christ addresses his under-shepherds. These letters were sent first to the angels of the church. And in other words, the Lord said, I'm going to hold you responsible. You're the guardian of the church. 
And when I read what I read in the second and third chapter, I take this to my prayer closet. I take this to the room and examine my heart. Lord, I'm one of your under, under shepherds. This, these letters were meant for all of us. If God didn't intend, if Christ didn't intend to speak to me, those same words that he's speaking to the pastors in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Laodicea, all these seven churches, he would not have included in the canon of Scripture. It would have died with, the, with John when he died on the Alpatmos. This would have been ended. The whole fair would have been gone. But because it's recorded here, he said it's for our understanding, for those upon whom the ends of the world have come. And I take this personally. And church, we cannot... We cannot slough off. We cannot put aside and we cannot ignore that these messages are Christ, represent Christ speaking to his church today. He spoke then and he speaks now. He's speaking and he's speaking to our hearts today and to Times Square Church. The pastor at Ephesus was told, now imagine opening these letters and it's addressed to the pastor. He's to take it as the guardian of the church. God says, in other words, the condition of your church, I'm holding you responsible for it. Whatever happens in the church, a dead pastor creates dead churches. There is there is never I have never in my lifetime seen a Holy Ghost pastor with a dead church who was preaching life and power and anointing because the. In time, that church will come alive and God will honor that ministry because there's an obedience to the word of God and the correction of the scripture. To the church of the Ephesians, the pastor was told, you've left your first love. You've fallen from into apathy. You must repent. To the pastor Pergamus, he said to the pastor, you've allowed false doctrine, a worldly Nicolaitan spirit is at work in your church. The pastor in Thyatira was told, an ungodly Jezebel spirit has overcome you. You are not dealing with sin in your house. The pastor of the church at Laodicea was told, you and your people become indifferent, lukewarm, prosperous. You are lukewarm, no fire, no spiritual hunger, no spiritual growth. Repent or I'll remove your candlestick. Now, this is, this, this is Christ's love. He's burning with love. He does. He loves his church. He loves his pastors. He's not angry at them, but he said, look what's happening. You have to wake up. You have to deal with issues now. And in love, he comes with these rebukes, loving rebukes and warnings. These three chapters have been so hidden from the church. Why is it? It's it's because in a backslidden condition, the spirit of apathy that the enemy has dropped like a cloud over hundreds of thousands of Christians, those who call themselves Christians. And Jesus warned this would happen. There'll be another gospel coming, another Christ. And there's a gospel preaching being preached today, and hundreds of thousands of Christians are flocking to it. This is a message without a cross. It's a message without sacrifice. It's a message without a hell or a devil. It's a message without a judgment seat of Christ or a great white throne judgment. It's a message without the coming of the Lord. It's just a soothing, quiet message of prosperity and goodness. And hundreds of thousands are buying the books and the tapes and flocking to these churches because they do not, are not willing to be convicted by the word of God. And because of this gospel, taking the hearts and the minds of hundreds of thousands of believers around the world, and I see it, it's preached on television mainly. And you listen and hear on radio, or you read the books and you hear these messages. There's never a mention of sin. There's never a mention of conviction. There's never a mention that Jesus is coming. There's never a mention that one day you're going to stand before a great weight throne judgment and we're going to give an account for all the deeds of our flesh. And one day, there are going to be multitudes stand before the Lord that were robbed of truth. 
And I made up my mind when I, the Lord asked me to come to New York and establish this church. That never on my watch, and I know this is in the heart of every pastor on this stage. On our watch, you will not go to hell. You'll not stand before Jesus. Having not been warned and lovingly warned with compassion and grace. And being convicted of sin, of righteousness and judgment through the Holy Spirit. I said, on my watch, Lord, as long as I live, as long as I preach in that pulpit, I will preach your word. I'll do it in love. I'll do it through tears. But we will not compromise the Lord of God and we will not take away people the capacity, the capacity to be moved and convicted by the Holy Spirit. And that's what's happened. The whole church world is being robbed of the capacity to be moved. And they can go now to any service. I, I tell you, if this kind of message was preached in some churches, they call mega churches today. And I'm not putting down all mega churches. This is a mega church. But if what I'm preaching to you this morning were preached in some of these churches, two thirds of the congregation would walk out before I'm finished. And another third would sit there with their hands folded and say, what's that about? It would not be moved. I could preach it through tears. I could preach it under the greatest anointing I've ever preached it, and it would not be moved. People, very few, just a remnant would be moved. The apostle, or rather Isaiah the prophet said, this is a rebellious people, children of falsehood, children who refuse to hearken to the law of Jehovah. And they say to the seers, see not. They say to the prophets, prophesy not so strictly. Speak soothingly to us. Prophesy illusions. Turn aside from the appointed way and decline from the spiritual path. Remove from our presence the Holy One of Israel. We don't want to hear about holiness. We don't want to be convicted. We don't want to be moved. If I were living in sin, that's the kind of church I'd want to attend. I wouldn't want anybody touching that would take my heart. This is not an indictment to all churches. No, not at all. I, I know mega churches and mega churches where God is truly moving and pastors that are truly touched by the hand of God. But this is what Isaiah said. That's, that's the, what it's going to come to. Give us a soothing message. Don't ruffle us. Don't convict us. Don't move us. Until finally there is no capacity left to be, ever be moved. Not able to blush anymore. Now of all the letters written to pastors in Revelation 2 and 3, the letter here to the pastor of Sardis has shaken me. To the pastor, angel, the church of Sardis, I know your works. You have a name that you live, but you're dead. He's warning us. He's warning me. David, I want, you to, I want you to see what happens and what has happened in history. Down through the years, churches that have died, that were once apostolic, full of the glory of Christ, a glory and a joy to the heart of the Father. Multitudes saved. People came from miles around. And now Jesus says they're dead. And when he says they're dead, they are dead. There's no way you can get around what he said. They're dead. Jesus said, I know your works. I know how you started because I gave you that name. In fact, when Sardis was mentioning at the time that this was written, their charity, their charity, their good works were, were so great that the very name fire anointing was given to the name of Sardis. You mentioned the church at Sardis. Everybody is thinking charity. Everybody is thinking the anointing and apostolic presence of Christ. 
This is a city that's very prosperous. A city province that's very prosperous. The richest man in the world at the time lived there. It was a gold smeltering place where they smelted gold. And it was known for its fine clothing that was exported around the world. Prosperity. Though it had crept into this apostolic church. And you would think that a church raised under the apostles and apostolic teaching would, would, would never grow cold or die. But it happened. Jesus said, you have a reputation that you live, but now you're dead. He said, now tell that to the congregation. Warn them that life is slipping away and the spirit of death is, has moved in among us. How did it happen? I sat in my study for hours saying, Jesus, you coming to this church that you love and the pastors that you, the pastors and elders that you love and you're saying there's death. How did it happen? What, what was the cause of this death? I want to know so I can avoid that in my own life and that the church can avoid it and that this, this church in particular can be a blazing church till Jesus comes. What were the causes of death in Sardis? And Jesus still had hope for this church. He said, thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And to the faithful remnant, Jesus said, be watchful. And actually, in Greek, it means become a watcher. Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect. And what it means in Greek is finished. Your work has not been finished. You have not fulfilled your calling yet before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and repent. I believe what Jesus is saying. You've settled into a comfort zone in Sardis. Sardis had settled into a comfort zone. And they they, they had rested on their achievements and everything is is paid for now and everything is running good and and God is prospered and blessed and now there's no fire, there's no zeal and something has been lost in this church. They're so relaxed now. The sense of we have arrived. Oh God, never let that happen to this church. Let it not happen to the lampstand churches around the world today. That any of us would think we have arrived. We could just settle down now and enjoy the presence of the Lord. Without the zeal, without the excitement, without the commitment. Jesus said, there are defiled garments. He said, there are few that have not been defiled in their garments. Now, folks, don't think now we're talking about adultery, fornication, Worshipping idols. Yes, those are defilements. But the real defilement that Christ, I believe, is referring to here is self-interest. Removing our focus from the house of God to our own houses. It, it is becoming so wrapped up in making our own living and doing our own thing. It, 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 it is... Losing that excitement we once had of just coming to the house of God until now it becomes a weariness because of self-interest, family, career, business becoming the first focus where once my house, he said, was the focus. Now, every man runs to his own house, the prophet Haggai said. Every man's running to his own interest. And I believe this is what happened in Sardis, self-interest, self-consuming time for family, which is scriptural, time for my business, time to run about doing my thing, but coming now and giving God two hours on a Sunday morning. Folks, I'm not rebuking this congregation. I'm speaking to my own heart. I know I had a pastor write to me this past week. He said, Brother Dale, I read where you stated 
in one of your newsletters that you thought you had preached too hard when you were younger. That your messages were too hard. He said, don't ever say that again because I'm a pastor and I'm bent on backsliding. And so are other pastors and churches. We're bent on backsliding. And he said, it was your message that drove me to my knees. And he said, it's still those messages that come from the heart of God that keep me on my knees. Don't change that word. No, no clapping. No clapping, please. Folks, this is what Jesus says can happen. And I fear it may have happened to some that have been under this teaching and preaching. If you're in this house where it's become a weariness now for you to get in the car. It's been a weariness for you to get in the subway. It's been a weariness to come. And so you, you come on a Sunday morning and, and we, we ask when this church was established. We would ask you if this is your church home. And folks, we're not trying to fill seats. The seats are already filled. This has to do with putting God's house first. We've asked that you attend at least two services a week. And that's not for our sake, it's for your spiritual health sake. To withstand the spirit that's in this city and the spirit of this age. Because we love you and we want to protect you. We're shepherds and we're responsible for standing before God one day and answer for the condition of this church and everyone who calls it home. Be responsible having brought forth the word that would convict you and move you and stir your heart. So you examine your heart like we are examining our own hearts. Jesus had warned this church earlier. The words of Christ had been preached in that church about not being choked by the cares of this life. Choked by the deceitfulness of riches. Prophet Haggai Gave an incredibly strong message to the church. Children of Israel were delivered from Babylon and sent back to Jerusalem to rebuild the house of God. That was their first commission. God wanted a place where he could visibly manifest his presence. There was to be a visible manifestation. People could go there and sense and feel and know and they could see the move of God and the evidence of his moving and his presence and the manifestation of his presence would be lives that would be changed before their very eyes. Just as we see here, Jesus manifests himself by healing marriages and by people coming up here. They want drugs or alcohol or they've been mixed up just like you when you came here and gave your heart to Christ or wherever you did. That was a manifestation of the presence of Christ. And that's why he lets us obtain, purchase and buy buildings and set up. What is called the building. This, this really is a part of his church. This is where we meet. This is where there is a visible manifestation of his presence. Now, yes, there is an invisible church around the world made up of believers, true believers, his body. But this is where we meet. It's a place where we get together in fellowship. It's a place where, where we corporately pray for the power and the glory of Christ in this house, in our families, and the nation, in the world. And if this is your church home, if this is where God has set you, this is where you have been fed, this is his house, this is where the charitable works flow to the world. This is where these good things that honor Christ are accomplished. And the prophet Haggai, they, they, they had started right and they had built, but they became discouraged over the years. And this is the second appeal of Christ, or, or, or of the Heavenly Father. And God once again comes to his church. Zerubbabel is told by the prophet Haggai and, and uh, the high priest. Joshua, this message came from God through the prophet Haggai. And he said, you say this is not the time to build. And interpreted, it means you are saying we don't have the time to build the church. 
We don't have time now. You say this is not the time to build the house. But is this the time for you to hide in your nice houses and my house be neglected? Had God said, has it come to this, that God delivered you and set you on a mission to build his house? And now you are so busy building your house, doing what is best for you, and you've neglected my house. And here's the question. Do you have the capacity to hear that? In the spirit, do you have the capacity in you to say, oh, God, my heart is open. Do I have the joy that I once had in your house? Do I have the excitement? Do I have the zeal in my prayer life? Do I, I still have the, the hunger to know you and to be intimate with you? Oh, Lord, have my own interest crowded out? Your concerns. God speaks through Haggai. And he says, now, Haggai, let me show the people what happens to those who neglect my house and run every man to his own house. He said, let me tell you what happens. And, folks, I want you to listen very closely to this. He said, you can't get ahead now, and your money goes into a bag with holes in it. Folks, it's very quiet in here. I'm not looking for an amen. But I'm asking you again, do you have the capacity to hear what the Spirit's saying? He said, if, if you neglect my house and you start giving all your focus to your own interest. And I'm no longer my house is no longer the center of your life. And my work. Has been put secondary. He said, your money is not going to go very far. I'm going to cut a hole in your bag. And it's going to drain out. He said, you look for much and it came to little. You brought it home and I blew on it. He said, you had all of these dreams. You had all these things you're going to do and, and, and you're going to do so many things and it's your interest. But he said, I, because you've neglected my house and my interest, they're no longer first and foremost in your life. I'm, I'm just going to blow on these things because I have a purpose for you and, and I'm not going to let you go astray. I love you too much. And he said, I called for a drought. And he said, you, you end up dry. And you end up being not satisfied. Everything you get, everything you purchase, everything you do, it brings no satisfaction to you. Now, folks, God is not against you and I being blessed. Not at all. What they should have been doing if they had put God's kingdom first, his work first, and got back to the building of the house of God instead of, of putting their own houses and interests first. He said they, they were to have their children under the table happy and their wives blessed. And he said, I'll, I'll bless your going out and your coming in. I'll bless you in the field. I'll bless you in the city. I'll bless your store. I'll bless your houses. God intended a blessing. But he said, because you have not put my house first, he said, these things are happening. Now, folks, there are exceptions to that. Sometimes when a nation is stricken with a, that perfect storm they call economic storm that rains on the just and on the unjust, there are other issues also. I understand that. But you need to maybe examine your heart. This morning, in light of what the prophet Haggai said, what he's actually saying, you, you wind up in debt, terrible debt, and there's misery with it. And he said, you can't get ahead. 
You strive and strive and you can't get ahead. You can't keep your head above the waters. And he said, why? In fact, this is what the the prophet said. God said, why? Do you want to understand why? He said, because my house lays neglected. As if you neglected my house. No, no, it's not a Mother's Day message. I'm not trying to be facetious, but I'm telling you, I preach this. I've asked God to give me love and grace. I stand behind as a helper and a prayer warrior for some of the godliest men on the face of the earth. And I am so proud in Christ of this church and the glory of God that's here. But this is God speaking to us. This is what can happen. This can happen. Don't think we're above it. Don't think this can't happen. And the Lord spoke to me. Don't think it can happen to you, David. Just neglect the prayer closet. Neglect my word. Neglect your tithe. Neglect giving what belongs to God. How the devil would like to keep you out of that choir loft. How he'd like to ground you and get you discouraged. And then bring you to a place where you, you just say, I, I've, I've put my time in. How the devil would like to make you weary of the spiritual warfare. And the Lord says, no, rouse yourself. He says, repent of that. Repent of it. And, oh, God, put the zeal. Jesus said the zeal of his house ate him up. God, I want the zeal of God to eat up my soul till I die. I want fire in my bones. The older I get, the more I want to burn. And that's what God wants for this church. The longer this church goes on, the greater the fire and the zeal of God in this house. The greater the love of Jesus that spreads abroad among us. Now, here's the good news. Amen. All right. The Bible said they obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the words of Haggai, the prophet. And the Lord, their God, that, that the Lord God had sent to them. And the people did fear before the Lord. And then Haggai prophesied, the Lord is with you. I believe God is with Times Square Church. I believe God is with those churches where the standards are being held and the gospel is truly being preached. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. God stirred them. Thank God they had the capacity. They were not beyond being stirred. They say, Holy Spirit, we hear it. We'll act on it. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord, their God. From that day, they heard it and they said, there's going to be a change. And they left their houses for a season. They still We're going to take care of their work. God said, you put first the kingdom of God and my righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You take care of my house, I'll take care of your house. I'll take care of your house. I'll take care of your children. I'll take care of your budget. I'll take care of that. (coughs) And if you have to go on Holy Ghost Relief, Jesus says, I'll be your social worker. I'll I'll be there. I'll take you through. (coughs) Haggai, I'll just read it. You don't have to turn there. Here's here's what God said. He said, this is when they were so interested in their own interest. He said, I smote you with blasting and mildew, with hail in the labors of your hand, but you didn't turn to me, saith the Lord. But now, he said, now that you've made my house first, now that you've gotten this new interest in what I'm doing, (coughs) consider now from this day and onward, From the fourth and twentieth day of the ninth month. He puts a date on it. Even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider this now. Is the seed yet in the barn? And is yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have not brought forth from this day? I'll bless you. He said, you may not see it right away. He said, but I have determined and I, I have commanded a blessing on you. From this day on, 
From the day you make that commitment and hear the voice of the Holy Ghost, he said, I am committed to bless you. If it happens on this day, sitting in your seat now, and you make a, a decision, I'm coming back, Lord, to your interest, whatever it costs me, whatever sacrifice. The Lord hath brought forth from this day, will I bless you. God did just that. God began to bless his people. And if you want to see what the blessings are of the old covenant, you can go. And those blessings, my, my God said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. And the moment you and I set our heart again afresh to sing with Holy Ghost gusto, not to come dragging in God's house, tired and weary of our own ways, and, and dragging ourselves into the house of God, but coming with expectancy, having prayed and sought God. Oh, do you pray for this church? Do you pray for its pastors? Do you pray that the fire of God will always be burning in this place? How else can our children know and see and experience manifestations of the presence of Christ? Unless you and I... Bring down his glory by the commitment. I told you this was not about Times Square Church, other than the warning of how it can happen. I don't believe it's going to happen. Or God wouldn't bring words like this. You've heard Pastor Carter, Pastor Neil, in fact, you've heard all the pastors. Bring forth these loving warnings and quickenings of the Holy Spirit. To keep us from going astray and allowing apathy, lethargy, or lukewarmness in our hearts. Will you stand? Holy Spirit, I'm asking and pleading with you that wherever people are hearing my voice right now and have heard this message, I pray, Lord, that you speak, speak to us as a body, as your church. Speak to our hearts and show us where we need to repent. Lord, I have repented. I've repented. There's some things you're showing me. That could lead to apathy and spiritual sloth. And Lord, you've laid hold of my heart. You have laid hold of my heart to seek you as never before. Lord, Tuesday this church goes to prayer and fasting. God, I pray that everyone in this house that has your burden and love for this house And for the people of God here in this city, that they would hear that. Lord, as we fast and pray together, that you will speak to us. And Lord, those who need to repent this morning, they can do that right now. And say, Holy Spirit, I am guilty. I have put my own interest ahead of yours. I've run to my own things, the things of this world that, that, that I felt so necessary. Lord, forgive. And let us leave this church this morning rejoicing. Let there be a praise break out in this service even this morning when we humble ourselves before you. <clears throat> Folks, does does it make sense to you that God would speak like this this morning? If you're going to speak this, would he not lay it upon the heart of the founder of the church?
Wouldn't the letter come to me first? That's not a boast. That's a confession. I would, I, what I would like to do in my flesh would be to somehow just move you and get you happy and excited and everybody jumping and praising the Lord. But the Holy Spirit is speaking deep to hearts. And when I walk off the stage and go to my apartment now, I want to know that I've delivered my soul. It's not easy to do. But, folks, I feel the Spirit speaking so loudly, so clearly. Have you become so busy? The only thing about Times Square Church to you now is Sunday morning for two hours. That's all it is. And you're not involved. When there's a plea for ushers, a plea for choir, a plea for workers of all kinds, and you, you want to come and just... Sit and be blessed. That's a recipe for dryness and a bag with holes in it. The Lord wants more for us. And I can't do it. I'm going to ask everyone that's in this house that has been moved. You've been moved. You've been stirred by the Holy Spirit. I want you to raise your hands and say, Lord, forgive. I I want to say that before this whole congregation and up in the balcony and in the annex everywhere. Just raise your hands. And would you just say it right out? Lord, uh, thank you for speaking in my heart and help me, Lord, not to go down that path. Help me, Lord Jesus, to put your interests first and show me how to do it, Lord Jesus. Show me how. Show me how, Lord. Speak to my heart. Quicken us. Folks, come on, let's just reach out to the Lord right now. Let's honestly open our hearts to the Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you for stirring my heart. Lord, let us never get to the place that we just listen to sermons. God, let there be a shout in this place because we are obedient to your word. Thank you for the word that's come forth all of these past years. Thank you for all the past. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you for this burning bush pulpit. And thank you for a congregation, Lord, that has loved you and blessed you so much. But now, oh God, keep the devil out of this house. Keep lethargy out of this house. God, keep this house burning on fire. Glory be to God. Now let's just worship him. Just worship him. Lord, I worship you. And I praise you. I give you honor and I give you glory. Oh, God. We love you, Jesus. We worship you. Folks, we need a new wave of worship. We, we need a baptism of worship to come upon our heart. Lord, baptize us to worship you now with a special love, renewing our love, O oh God, renewing our passion. Renew our passion for you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you for all your blessings, Lord. You have blessed this church. You have blessed its pastors. You have blessed the families. You have been so good, and we thank you for that. But now, O Lord, we hear you, Jesus. We hear you in the midst of the candlesticks. We hear you walking among us and saying, Now, I want to bless you. I want you to be anointed. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning, and you have strayed from the Lord, or you're not right with God, we invite you to slip out of your seat. The balcony, either side, come down. Uh, the stairs on either side, come down the aisle, come here, I'll pray with you. If, if you say, Pastor David, <clears throat> I've been dealt with lovingly by the Holy Spirit this morning. I need to be awakened. I, I, there's been a coldness that has gripped my heart or a lukewarmness. Don't come unless the Spirit draws you. But if you feel the Lord speaking, it doesn't matter to me whether ten or five here. What is 
important is that you respond to the Holy Spirit when he speaks to you. Otherwise, this quickening, this moving can just sputter out when you get out the door. Confirm it. Seal it. And say, Jesus, I want this to change me. Wherever you're at, slip out of your seat and I'll pray for you in just a moment. You know, when we obey the word of the Lord and walk in the spirit, all of the devil's plans are exposed. All of his devices are exposed. And the church builds a defense. And God is building a wall around this place. He's building a wall around you and your family. That's what he wants to do, build a wall around you. And that you will never have to stand before the Lord and see your works burn. But to see and know that you have obeyed the word of God and the call of the Holy Spirit. And you that have come forward, I don't know what your need is. I'm not going to preach my sermon again. I don't know what your need is, but for some reason you came. Many of you come, came and said, I've been moved in my heart and I, I need to make a new commitment. And those of you who have been cold in your heart or drifting away from the Lord, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be uh, some great uh, deep theological prayer, just a simple prayer. God's looking at the heart, just at the heart. That's, that's what defilement is. It's a heart condition. It's something that has our heart. And if something has your heart, if, if you're wrapped up so much in a house, furniture, clothes, shopping, all of those things, None of them evil themselves. But if these things have your heart, you can never put the things of God first. Everything else, and you will go further and further off into this kind of defilement. And it only becomes defiled when you neglect the things of God. And those things, you go after your things at the expense of the work of God. Will you pray this prayer with me, please, from your heart? <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I thank you. That you've given me a heart that can be stirred and moved. Thank you, Jesus. Now forgive me for my self-interest replacing your interest. And I hear you and I respond. Lord, awaken my soul and bring me back to my first love. I need your touch. I need to be refreshed. Cleanse me, Lord Jesus. I come for a hungry heart. Put hunger in my heart. Put thirst in my heart to go deeper in you, Jesus. Now, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for hungry hearts. I thank you for people who are willing to come and say, I have a need. Thank you, Lord, for a church who so quickly responds to the word of the Lord. Jesus, speak life now. Speak faith. Speak hope into the hearts of this body. Lord, to know that the hand of God, the blessing of God is available to us as we, we just come and put you first in our lives. Everything, Lord, focused on you, Jesus. We'll never get away from that focus. Lord, I want you to bring healing and strength and peace to all those who have responded into this whole body in the annex and here in the main house. In Jesus' name. This is the conclusion of the message.